Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is a story about fear. It's also a story about faith and the impact that they each have on the other. Many of us know something about living in fear these days, so it's vitally important that we also know quite a bit about faith. This particular story happened at a time that was filled with fear for the followers of Jesus. Herod was the ruler, and he had just killed John the Baptist. Some of you will remember this story. He, Herod was having an affair with the wife of his brother, Philip, and John had the gall to say, you know what? You should not be doing that. And that made Herod mad. He didn't want to hear about it. He did not want to be told that he shouldn't take whatever he felt like he should have. And so at a kind of drunken party one night, he offers the daughter of his lover anything she wants. And the girl has been told to tell him, what I want is the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And that's what Herod gave her. This was an act of revenge in one way for John having the presumption to tell Herod what to do. But it was also a message that was designed to evoke terror in all the people that would follow John's ways, and he had a big following. John was a good friend of Jesus's. He was a relative and the one that was chosen to prepare the way of the Lord. So you can imagine what the news of John's death did to Jesus and his disciples. It was devastating. When Jesus heard about it, he went away by himself to a deserted place. And many of us can understand that when our hearts are broken, when the world seems just unbelievably horrible, you want to get away for a moment. And he tries to go away, but he's got so many people now that believe in him and want to be with him that this huge crowd followed him. And so there he is, and he looks out, and he has compassion for all of these people who have so much wrong in their lives that they are looking for him to heal. Well, his disciples look around, and after a while they say, you know, we are in kind of a deserted place, and there's all these people, and it's late in the day. They're getting hungry. Tell them to go home. They need to go home and eat. And you may remember Jesus told them, you give them something to eat. And they had looked around and said, but we've got five loaves and two fish, and there are 5,000 men and additional women and children here. We can't feed them. And Jesus took those loaves, and he blessed them, and he gave them to the disciples, who gave them to the people. And when everybody was fed, there were still 12 baskets of leftovers. So the disciples know Jesus is capable of doing some pretty amazing things, and they watched as faith in him triumphed over the fear that we don't have enough, that somehow there's not enough here for everybody. 
But as soon as they'd all eaten, Jesus still needs to get that time alone. He still needs to be with God where he can just think and feel. And so it says immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and they were supposed to go to the other side of this body of water while Jesus dismissed the crowds. He's trying to get to that prayer time. So he goes up a mountain. A mountain is a place in the Bible where lots of good things happen. Lots of times you're closer to God than ever. And he's finally alone with his thoughts, his feelings, and God. The disciples are not faring so well, though. They're out in the middle now of this body of water, and the winds come up, and their boat is being tossed, and the waves are high. And I imagine they were a little anxious, but most of them were fishermen, so I assume they knew how to take care of situations like this. What really scared them was when they saw in the middle of the night Jesus walking towards them on the water. Even though he had just fed these 5,000 plus people with a little bit of food, they've never seen anybody walking on water. And so their immediate assumption is he is a ghost and they are absolutely terrified. They cried out in fear and then Jesus says to them, as God is so often saying to people in the presence of great power, do not be afraid. He tells them, it's me. Well, they haven't seen this before, so Peter's still not exactly sure, and he says to him, if it's really you, Lord, tell me to come to you on the water. It's a bold request, isn't it? So Jesus says, come. Now, Peter's a bold man. He's the one that often leaps before he looks. He, he frequently gets himself into trouble by just stepping out in some kind of moment of passion. But his faith is G in Jesus is strong, and he's ready, and he steps out in faith on that water, and by golly, he starts to do it. He's walking on the water. But then many of you will remember, like I do, Saturday morning cartoons where Wiley Coyote is chasing after the roadrunner, and he runs off the cliff, and for a moment he's running on thin air, and then he looks down, and at that point he falls. Peter has this same experience. And you know, we have all had a similar experience in our lives. Don't get too hung up in this story on whether you believe somebody actually walks on water. Because as I told the kids, we have all done things we thought were possible. And this is a teaching story about that. I want you to think about watching a baby learn to walk for the first time. You might guess our granddaughter is now doing that. So I've, I've been reminded. And you know, those first few steps are so wobbly, and they fall all the time. They take one step and boom, down they go. It's a really good thing they still wear diapers at this stage, and they're low to the ground because they've got cushioned bottoms and not fall to far, fall to far to fall, there we go, and they end up on the ground. And you might think that when this happens over and over again, they would give up. But often their parents are standing there with outstretched arms saying, come on, come on, you can do this. And they see these people who must be like gods to them. Parents know everything when you're a little kid, right? These people are walking, and I can do it too because they tell me I can and so every one of us in this room kept trying, even though we fell time after time, somehow we believed we could do it, we kept trying, and now we don't think a thing about it. But those people who encouraged us were really important to us. They made us believe that we could do it. So here's Peter, and he steps out in faith, and then he takes his eyes off of Jesus because all of a sudden he remembers it's really windy and the waves are really high and this ocean is a scary, dangerous place and he starts to sink. And then Jesus catches him. Jesus saves him. He pulls him out of the water. And we don't know the tone of voice that Jesus used. I often come back to this. I really wish we had an audio version of the Bible as it actually happened. 
If I was making that audio version and narrating this story, I would use a gentle, loving tone for what Jesus said. Some people might imagine a harsh one. What he said was, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when you say it like that to me, it's another way of saying, I know you can do this. Believe it. Believe in yourself. So Peter and Jesus get into the boat, the wind stops, and those in the boat worshipped him. They know that he has power over the wind and the waves, and they say, truly, you are the son of God. Well, we have a lot to learn from this story, from Peter and from Jesus. The world has always, I guess, seemed like a scary place, but sometimes it feels a little scarier than others, and lately our headlines have been scary. There are threats from North Korea about nuclear warheads on missiles that could reach our nation. And there are threats we're sending in return about what will happen if they dare to escalate those threats. And we wonder if the world's about to experience a nuclear war. It's a terrifying prospect. I can't proclaim that I know exactly what Jesus would say or do in this situation, but I know what he did when his own life was in danger. He continued to proclaim peace. And he never, ever backed down about what he knew to be true about God. These last two days, we've heard terrible news coming out of Charlotte, Virginia. White supremacists, neo-Nazis, and skinheads and Ku Klux Klan members stage a march designed to provoke some terror. They carried torches reminiscent of mobs at lynchings and cross burnings as they protested the removal of a Confederate monument left over from a time when people said it is okay for some humans to own other human beings. The march was designed to provoke fear and counter protesters gathered to show solidarity with black people and Jewish people and racial and ethnic slurs flew and eventually violence erupted because Violence breeds violence, that's what happens. A car emerged and slammed into the counter protesters, killing one and injuring many more. At last count, four people were hospitalized in good condition, six in fair condition, four in serious condition, and five people were in critical condition. One woman was killed in the crowd. Two officers also died in a helicopter crash related to this event. What is happening in our world? And what do we do with our fear and our hurt and our anger? You know, fear does terrible things to people. I think that's why God and Jesus and the angels go around all the time saying, do not be afraid, even when there is good reason to be afraid. We don't like to be afraid, and we don't like to be hurt. And if we think we're going to be hurt, we get scared. And when we are hurt and scared, we often get angry. We strike out at the things that are hurting us or scaring us, sometimes irrationally. Sometimes in our striking out, we bring on the very thing that we are the most afraid of. We aren't the only ones. I think it's instinctual. When I was young, I worked for a veterinarian in a hospital for dogs and cats, and I learned that even the nicest family pet, if it's hurt badly enough, can bite you or scratch you because they're trying to protect themselves from something they don't understand. And even when someone is trying to help them, when they're hurt and they're scared, they react with violence. You know, as long as Peter was looking at Jesus and trusting in him, he could do this amazing thing. But the second he took his focus off of Jesus and what he represented in the world and focused on the scary things, the wind and the waves, he let fear get the better of him. And he sank. The very thing he was most afraid of happened. The good news was that Jesus was right there to save him and to encourage him to have more faith. You can do this. 
Sometimes the things we fear aren't necessarily physical dangers, but we succumb to perceived threats about our choices in life. We can become very selfish sometimes. In tracing the history of groups like the KKK, one of the themes that runs through it is fear of losing our way of life. But our way of life to them meant somebody else has to be on the bottom. During the Civil War, the freeing of slaves meant the end of a way of life for some people who enjoyed large property with free labor to help them manage it. Later in the 1920s, it centered around the influx of Catholics and Jews fleeing from Eastern Europe during wartime. And then after World War II, groups formed to oppose the Civil Rights Movement, all because some people felt their way of life was changing, and their way of life involved dominating other people. Sometimes the KKK has claimed to be Christian, but killing and maiming and terrorizing other people based solely on the color of their skin or on their ethnic group or their religious identity is not a part of Jesus' way. One country terrorizing another is not any different. In the book of Revelation, the description of heaven includes these words. I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Everyone is represented in that picture. And in Paul's letter to the Philippian church, he admonishes us to do nothing out of selfish vein or conceit or ambition. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is not always easy to do. If someone else intends to harm us, of course we are going to want to defend ourselves. And yet we are called to love others as we love ourselves, which means we have to ask how our wants and needs impact the lives of others. Is what I want or what I think I need good because it's best for me or because it's best for everybody? That's the kind of question Jesus asks. How do my choices affect others? The Good Samaritan was terribly inconvenienced when he stopped to help the person who had beaten and robbed on the side of the road. It wasn't best for him. He could have kept on going. But it was best for somebody else. So we have to choose Hate, when people choose hate and violence to terrorize and suppress others, we have to stand up and say, this is not the way of Christ. Peter was bold enough to believe that he could do miracles because of his relationship with Christ. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he could. But when he stopped focusing on Christ and started focusing on fear for himself, bad things began to happen. Jesus was there to pick him up and encourage him to try again. And this seems like a good time for us to refocus on Christ, to look for him, to trust that the words he told us about loving one another and living together in peace is indeed the right way, and to put our trust in a loving God. We need to pray as Jesus did always, but especially in our story today, we know he went to times of prayer when he was troubled. Clifton Kirkpatrick says, what is so clear from this passage is that we are called to step out in faith, even in the midst of troubled waters, if we are to be faithful to the call of Christ. Stepping out in faith is not a guarantee that we will not face troubled waters or be filled with fear. And he adds a quote from William Willimon. If Peter had not ventured forth, had not obeyed the call to walk on the water, then Peter would never have had this great opportunity for recognition of Jesus and rescue by Jesus. Willimon says, I wonder if too many of us are merely splashing about in the safe shallows 
and therefore have too few opportunities to test and deepen our faith. The story today implies if you want to be close to Jesus, you have to venture forth out on the sea. You have to prove his promises through trusting his promises, through risking and venture. In some ways, it doesn't take a whole lot to turn things around. Doc Hollingsworth points out that in this story, the disciples move from being absolutely terrified to worshiping Christ. And he says between their fear and their worship of Christ is one disciple's risk of, and security in the arms of grace. The trust and risk of one follower of Jesus has an effect on the whole community. Individuals who risk boldly and move toward the call of Jesus can make a difference in the lives of other believers. Jesus says, do not be afraid. He invites us to step boldly out of the boat and into the storm with faith that he can calm the waters. What can you do this week to make a difference in the lives and the beliefs of others? Amen.